so much, Wendy. I recently saw a clip of the Marx Brothers doing the four-hand piano. We didn't quite have that comic routine, but we were close. All right, let me get my timer set, too. Okay. Here we go. So it's really great to be here with all of you 30 years after we marched out from graduation. And I was motivated to talk with you because you're such an amazing group and because we are facing some really huge changes. Planetary changes, societal changes, and like the world needs you. And out of all the issues around climate change, I thought, wow, I could talk about the 100 Chinese cities we analyzed, 23 indicators, entropy-weighted indexing. And I'm like, no. <laughs> no, I really want to draw your attention to two things that maybe very few of us focused on during our undergrad studies. And so when we're thinking about climate change in cities, tonight, let's think about people first and think about equity. And also, let's think about other living things and think about ecology. And with that reframing, I wonder what strategies you can come up with. And in keeping with this idea of focusing on people, Please take a moment, the person next to you, to acknowledge their humanity. A high five, a hug, go for it. <laughs> awesome. So I, I grew up in a forest in Wisconsin. I did not smoke cheese flavored cigarettes. And so it's kind of fascinating that now my research is focused on cities. I'm a professor at University of San Francisco in environmental science. I also collaborate with the Berkeley National Lab. Um, back in the day, besides playing piano with Wendy, once I was an MIT Battle of the Bands playing saxophone, but lately I've revived my musical career so my kids will think I'm cool. <laughs> that center picture is actually a now photo from the gig recently. And I also want to take a moment to <coughs> thank, remember our mentors and our teachers because now we are in that role, right, of mentoring. And at the time, I didn't even realize how amazing some of these people were. I studied piano at 8 a.m. in the morning with Claudia von Cannon, who was a harpsichordist from Vienna. I studied Aikido with a master, Dick Stroud, who was also an amazing artist. And he taught me how to fall down and get back up again. That's like one of the best skills, <laughs> right? Professor Adele Serafim in chemical engineering he was from Egypt, and when I started doing policy work, he kind of checked my cultural competence and said, always remember, like, recognize your bias. One of the best lessons I ever learned. I started um, undergraduate research with Professor Cho Kyun Ra in bioengineering, and I didn't even know until later, like, what an impression to be, to see a really kick-ass engineer who was also a rather wild and whimsical woman. <laughs> and then the MIT Japan program, which helped me get started. Okay, so here we go. The challenge. We're now at our 30th reunion. We've hit the 50-year-old mark. <laughs> Plus, right? Um, the world, humans as a whole around the globe, more than 50% of the population lives in cities. We've you know, passed that rural threshold. We're seeing increased disparity in the U.S. In the U.S., 
about half the population is classified as low income or in poverty. And at that same time, if we look beyond humans, we have triggered, humans have triggered what some people call the sixth mass extinction. We're losing biodiversity and, you know, carbon dioxide over 400 parts per million. Wow. Big challenge before dinner. <laughs> so I wanted to draw on a very good tradition of MIT, which is systems thinking. All these pieces interconnect. So how, with that bigger picture, can we come up with strategies, putting people first and life first? So when we're thinking about cities and cities as systems, we want those systems to serve people. We wouldn't have cities if it weren't for people, right? So I just putting images of these different kinds of city systems. That's a picture of Angela Davis, super activist, who is also a great systems thinker, recognizing systemic racism and prison industrial complex. More often, we think of urban infrastructure. That's the Tokyo subway map. Climate, we think of the physical part. But ecologically, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for plankton, photosynthesizing plankton. So another great systems thinker was the urban planner, Jane Jacobs, who said that cities are about diversity. And it's that liveliness, that intensity, that helps cities regenerate and keep recreating themselves. And we'll just skip some of these. So I want to share a couple specific examples from the research I've been doing of cities that are connecting all of these considerations and working systemically. And some of the examples are surprising. Like I could have picked a Boston example, but I haven't been here lately. So one place I have been lately is Detroit. And it's kind of an interesting example of a city that suffered because it had a, a mono-industrial focus, right? The dangers of losing diversity, whether it's the economy or the biology. So Detroit facing bankruptcy, you had population flight resulting in vacant lots, meaning that all of the city infrastructure was oversized and under you know, less revenue to operate. And ongoing, I was there at the 50th anniversary of the Detroit riots. So it's really amazing to be there at that time. And if that weren't enough on the social side, on the climate side, they're getting hit by more frequent storms, a lot of flooding, alternating snowstorms and heat waves, the heat waves cause smog. And what did they do? The governor sent in a pointy, an appointee to take over the bankrupt city. And they're like, oh, water. We're losing money. Shut off water to people who aren't paying, which caused an international outcry. And then you see the reminder of water being a human right. So a coalition of organizations got together and said, OK, given our problems, what can we do? And they developed this plan for blue-green infrastructure. The blue means it's dealing with water, especially stormwater management. The green meaning you're using growing things. And they said, with all the vacant, already vacant spaces, OK, not gentrification, not kicking out disadvantaged communities, which is what was happening in New Orleans, they said, we could devise this integrated system of stormwater management for less cost and less impact than building a big new concrete stormwater tunnel. And at the same time, that 
those blue green so we're talking about um, parks that serve a dual purpose for uh, stormwater infiltration and retention ponds we're talking about bile swales and stormwater boulevards so these are also spaces that are amenities for the community so yeah detroit and you have all that great music i yeah. went to the you know, jack white return back to detroit and built his new record facility okay so that's detroit in brazil really famous example ofer said he, he knows about curitiba this was a city facing population growth weak economy, not a lot of money, but the mayor was an urban planner who said, let's think about people first. So they were having a problem with the slums and favelas, that there was trash all over, like there wasn't a lot of uh, hard to get uh, city services out there. So he said, oh, we'll pay people with bus tokens because people need to get to work. They bring in trash, we'll pay you with a bus token. Multiple problems solved. They also had flooding from the river, so they turned public parks into these retention basins. And they invented bus rapid transit. We don't have money to build a subway. Let's make buses run like a subway. Dedicated lanes, boarding platforms. We'll just have really good bus drivers. So that's a case of smart people <coughs> more than smart technology. Okay, on the other side, brief view, Copenhagen. In terms of making their city low carbon to deal with climate change, they came up with a very integrated energy system. So thanks so much, Debbie, for talking about the challenges of going renewable on supply side. So with Copenhagen, they're also trying to reduce demand side and kind of cross-connect using waste heat from industry to help provide district heating and also using offshore wind and also use it for cooling using some of the water from the harbor. So they got a whole heat exchange system going so quite clever, and they're very ambitious, carbon neutral, uh, seven years. <laughs> All right, almost to the end. So I was going around the world looking at examples, and some of my students in my master's class, I gave them this research assignment too. And one group of students was looking at Durban, South Africa. All right, so it's on the more on the east eastern coast of South Africa. A lot of poverty, a lot of informal settlements, but also very a lot of attention to international environmental issues. And they got funding from the Rockefeller Foundation 100 Resilient Cities program to analyze what could they do, what could the city do to deal with the impacts of climate change. They went through this process, you know, steps, indicators, and then they blew my mind because in their report they said, thank you very much, but we're here to remind you that one size does not fit all. Your framework doesn't know anything about African urbanism, we're trying to get basic services to people in informal settlements. They said resilience is just a step. They said apartheid was resilient. We want transformation. And thanks also to Debbie for bringing that term to us as well. We want transformation. Climate disruption means big change, not incremental change. So it's an opportunity to reframe our economies, to reframe our social institutions, to address inequity. So they're like, hey, bring it on, transformation. 
So, with that, I leave you with this photo I took of street art in New Orleans. It's a really moving photo. The caption is light, and it's of this girl who sometimes acts like a tree. So giving, not asking in return. And I was thinking of our, you know, the MIT logo and phrase of men's at Manus, you know, hands and head, hands and mind, which is kind of a departure from just the brain focus part. But I want to challenge you and ask you to be involved in also thinking what happens when we broaden our perspective to include nature and to include the heart and thinking of people and equity. If we put people first, if we optimize to that, we'll come up with better, better strategies. Thank you.